Hi, and welcome to Allen High School's pre-AP chemistry class. We are beginning our unit on gas laws. And I think you'll really like this. We're going to take a little deviation from stoichiometry, although stoichiometry will come back and revisit us. It's such an important concept. Now, I'm going to start out with an overall discussion of the concepts. And then we will move into mathematics. Most of the mathematics will be done in class in the form of an inquiry. So let's jump in. I do want to give you one heads up. I'm trying to do this with bringing in your notes into my Mimeo program as opposed to a PowerPoint to see if it's easier for you to follow. So let me know if that's the case. All right, we're going to begin the discussion with a theory the molecular theory of gases. Now, remember a theory is de designed to try to provide an explanation for why things happen in our chemical and physical world. We want to get beyond the fact that they happen, which you saw in your movie. You're going to see a lot of familiarity from that into the why things happen. Now, kinetic molecular theory has five basic postulates. You need to know these five postulates. You need to memorize the five things we're about to talk about. All right, the first is that gas molecules, uh, gases consist of molecules whose separation is much larger than the size of the molecules themselves. In other words, this radius of the molecule is minuscule compared to the distance between molecules and compared to the volume of the container. Another way of saying this is that the volume that the gases uh, have themselves is negligible compared to the volume of the container. So we're going to completely neglect the fact that as in all matter has uh, mass and takes up space. We're going to neglect the space they take up and we're gonna focus on the volume of the container. All right, the next premise, particles move in straight line paths and in random directions. There's, there's no thinking processes going on to tell them to curve or turn or avoid. Particles collide frequently with the sides of the container and much less frequently with one another. And very importantly, all of those collisions are elastic. There's no energy gained or lost as a result of the kinetic, or transferred really, as the result of the collisions. Particles in a gas do not repel nor attract one another. So if we're looking at the air, it's not like nitrogen's going, oh cool, oxygen's around, I really need to uh, behave a little bit better and smash against the walls harder. No, there are no intermolecular, remember those forces between molecules, intermolecular forces. No IMFs. Now that's an assumption, and we're going uh, to find when you're in AP chemistry, we'll deal with situations in which this is no longer true and this is no longer true, especially this one. But for now, we're going to deal with only those gases that behave according to this. All right, the last premise, the average kinetic energy of all gas particles is proportional to the temperature. So on average, temperature measures the average kinetic energy of particles. So as the kinetic energy increases, the temperature increases. Temperature is something we measure. Okay. Now, if a gas behaves according to all of these things, we call that gas an ideal gas. And that's what we'll be dealing with in our unit, our ideal gases. Now, we saw this in the movie, the quantities that we can measure to describe the state of a gas are pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. 
Now, the pressure has a variety of units, unfortunately. Uh, the SI unit is kilopascals. A common unit is atmospheres, mainly because it's very easy to divide by one. And we have millimeters of mercury because pressure used to be measured by seeing how high mercury rose in a column when a pressure was exerted on, on it. And so we measured that height of the column. And the guy, the dead guy who studied that is Torricelli. So a mercury, millimeter of mercury is the same thing as a tor. No conversion, just swap out those units. Now volume can be measured in a variety of ways. One of the key ways it's going to be measured is in liters. For those of you who go on to IB, they care very much that you know a liter is a decimeter cubed. Also in the medical field, they'll often use that. Milliliters, which is also a centimeter cubed, often called a CC. Again, the medical field uses that a lot. So those are our two very common ones. Temperature, Kelvin, 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 period, only Kelvin, never Celsius or Fahrenheit. Amount, remember I said in the movie they talked about is that molecules? Well, we're going to be counting those molecules via the heart of chemistry moles. Uh, I think I hinted at this. Kelvin units. You've seen this conversion. Don't do any calculation without it being in Kelvin units. If temperature measures the average kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is one half mv squared, velocity squared can't be negative, mass can't be negative, kinetic energy therefore can't be negative, which leads us to the conclusion that temperature can never be negative. It's kind of a negative of a negative. Anyway, you get the idea. So Kelvin is our temperature scale that is always positive. All right, so those are our units that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, what we want to focus on initially with pressure and volume, because we're going to deal with changes in pressure and volume at first. And in that case, we just have to be concerned that we are using the same unit within our calculation. Later on, we're going to be a little bit more constrained. But for now, we just need to make sure that everything is the same, all right? And we have those conversion factors. Be very caution, cautious, warning, warning, warning. You will be told that a gas is at STP. And it will be assumed that if you see that a gas is at STP, that that means we're at a pressure of one atmosphere and a temperature of zero Celsius, which we don't ever want to talk about Celsius. We want to talk about Kelvin. So 273 Kelvin. Or if the Celsius goes to the tense place, I'll usually put 273.15 Kelvin there. All right? Don't forget to use those values when you see STP. Now, we're going to be looking at a variety of experiments, but a good experiment has only two variables, one independent and one dependent, and then all the rest are controlled. So we had a series of different experiments that were done in, wow, probably the 1600s, a bunch of dead guys. And I am so sorry, but somebody thinks it's very important that you know what each dead guy studied. So Boyle studied pressure and volume effects on a gas, which means that temperature and moles have to be held constant. Now, the mathematical relationship for this is an inverse relationship. If you increase the pressure on a system, you will decrease the volume until the internal pressure is equal to my exterior, external pressure. Okay? So if you increase your external pressure, the volume will decrease until the interior pressure is equal to the exterior. Now, unfortunately, the formula doesn't show that very well, but I can show this in class if you don't believe me. 
So P1V1 is equal to P2V2, is an expression of Boyle's law. Now you can make up some phrases to remember that Boyle studied pressure and volume. Like I used to say, Boyle's, <coughs> Boyle is very pretty. But a student of mine came up with, Boyle's are very pussy. Um, whatever you want, it, and you can share it with the class as long as it is school appropriate. Okay, very important. I can't tell you how many multiple choice questions are going to come from this chart alone. All right. Now, if I divided both sides by volume one, I think you can see the inverse relationship a little better. Do you see if you put them opposite one another, they are inversely proportional. Okay, Charles studied temperature and volume which means Charles had to keep pressure and moles constant if he wanted to have an accurate study. And hopefully you know that if you increase the temperature, just like in our tires, we're going to increase the volume. So they are directly proportional. And the formula we typically see is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Now you don't see the direct proportionality necessarily there, but if I multiply both sides by T1, you see V2 and T1 are directly proportional to one another. But this is the form we'll be using mathematically most often. All right, let's jump into, oh, a phrase, Charles watches TV. So come up with a good one and share it with the class. They're really helpful. And you do need to know these dead guy's names. And I'll show you yet another way later on. Okay, Char Gay Lussac studied pressure and temperature and kept volume and moles constant. Now, you know, these guys gave each other a little credit for different things. So there's, you know, not always exact... Uh, Attribute, uh, attributes to who got what law, but this is the way that we teach them. So Gay-Lussac studied P and T, and uh, there's a, a few, few ways that you can remember that, is, is that uh, Gay drives a PT cruiser, however you want to come up with one and share it with the class if it's school appropriate. Now, if we increase the temperature, we're going to increase the pressure. And the reason we do that is because as you increase temperature, and that's going to be true for both of these guys here, increase in temperature meant that there was an increase in kinetic energy. Increase in kinetic energy means there's an increase in the force with which the molecules are hitting the sides of the container. Now, if the pressure is held constant, then that increased force is going to cause an increase in uh, volume. If volume is held constant, then that increase in force is going to cause an increase in pressure. Pressure is equal to force per unit area. So if you increase that force, you're going to increase the pressure. And we see a very similar formula because it's a direct relationship. P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. Now, Avogadro's law, we don't study quite as much. Avogadro studied volume and moles, keeping pressure and temperature constant. Hopefully, you realize if you add more air to your balloon, you're going to increase the volume. More molecules hitting the sides of the container, pushing out the sides of the container. Right? So in that case, we would have um, V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. Now, here's the deal. You don't have to memorize these individually. We're going to see a composite one in our next video. But you do need to memorize whether or not these are direct or inverse. And then we're going to see some graphs in our next video as well. So until we combine this all together, this is signing off.